This is Mark Brower, and welcome to this second installment of this series, 911 for Men. Tonight, we're going to talk about the inner lives of men. And as we begin, I first I want to thank you for coming and being part of this, watching the recording last week, some great comments we got. A um, couple of you commented about the vulnerability that I shared or that I exhibited in telling my own story. I'll, but I'll, I'll tell you, I, I've been teaching about this stuff for like 15 years now. The story is out. It's all over the place. Um, and uh, if it's helpful to other people, I'm uh, you know happy to share my own story. But also, you know, part of it is I've gotten more willing to talk about this uh, because the more I learn about this, the more I realize how common this struggle is. And uh, so I'm, I think I'm a little less, um, less hesitant to talk about it than maybe I was early on. I also had a question about how much I'm going to get into other issues in this series, uh, it, other issues like... Um, abuse and trauma from our upbringing and how that affects us as men. And and I'll just say uh, those are really important questions and important topics. Uh, we're not going to be able to get into them in this series. Uh, the program that I run that's going to be a follow-up to this, the Renewed Man program, we do cover that. There's actually a, a week focus on uh, w- what we call making peace with our past. And that has to do with coming to terms with abuse and abandonment and other kinds of trauma. But we won't be talking about that so much here. Before we begin tonight, I just want to give us permission as we start, uh, like I did last time when we had this the, the session last time, to just let ourselves relax a little, take a deep breath. Uh, it, we're doing this on a Tuesday night, and so I'm going to guess that... Um, a number of you uh, have been busy throughout the day, you know, and or if you're watching this on video, maybe you've just coming out of a really busy time. So just uh, just chill, give your give yourself permission to chill during this time, and also uh, focus on this session. Uh, it's tempting when we're when we're behind a computer or on our phone to just multitask, and I encourage you not to do that and just focus on what we're talking about here. And I will try to make good use of our time. All right. So in the last video, uh, Sunday night, gave a little bit of an overview of the crisis of healthy masculinity in our world today. And there is so much we could talk about, but I've chosen to zoom in on four particular challenges. Um, The challenges of stress and anxiety uh, because of the pressure that a lot of men feel. Uh, the pressure or the, the, the challenge of loneliness, isolation, um, where we don't have a group of guys around that we can really trust enough to be honest with about what's going on in our lives, guys that we like to hang out with, guys that we're on this, the, the same journey, guys that can help us, help us grow. Uh, without that in place, uh, we struggle as men. We're, we sort of have this built-in need for brotherhood for um, for a tribe. And then lack of intimacy in struggles in marriage in our in our partnership, intimate partnership, not being as close with our wives as we'd like to be. or maybe if we're single, um, it would be you know not feeling like we're in a good place to, to attract that person. Um, you know what, what do I need to do to be ready for that that kind of a relationship? Also, um, we'll get into this more next week, but uh, a lot of men feel a lot of disappointment uh, bordering on resentment because their their sex life, their physical intimacy is not what they would like it to be. So we're going to talk more about that. Um, And that's a a thing that, you know, men are dealing with. And then finally, the the fourth thing, we didn't talk about this so much last time, um, but I want to bring it up here tonight. And that is the issue of spiritual disillusionment, um, spiritual confusion or or letdown, like lack of meaningful spiritual life. And, and I realize when I do this presentation here, I'm talking to a lot of people who are believers, to, to people who are Christians, church-going people. And yet what I see uh, a lot in the church and then other people that I know who are dropping out of church, uh, people who had, I'm going to call these the three Ds, um, 
these uh, disillusionment, doubt, and discouragement. Question, you know, doubt comes up because questions. Uh, we we don't really know what to do with them. We're not sure if we if you know uh, if we feel comfortable talking about them, but but they linger. We get discouraged. Uh, maybe we just don't have the spiritual interest or enthusiasm that maybe we did earlier on in our lives, or kind of like maybe what we observe other people having. And then of course disillusionment because we some people have had bad experiences with churches or with spiritual leaders. So a lack of a meaningful spiritual life. Now, these, these four battles are inner battles that men are dealing with. And it should be said that men throughout history have dealt with these. But there's something different today. There's something, I believe, that's unique today that is uniquely challenging that's making all this worse. So uh, I'm going to call it a tidal wave. And, and here's uh, a, an analogy. Imagine you're on a stand-up paddleboard. And um, if you are like me, you have a hard time staying up on the, st- on the stand-up paddleboard, having the right, the balance to do that. Um, it's one thing to do that when the water is calm. Um, but when you're on the ocean and there's waves, it's challenging. The, the first time I did it, the, when I, the first time I learned to do stand-up paddleboarding was was um, on an island in the Pacific Ocean or off of the island on the ocean. And it was, uh, I spent more time in the water than I did on the, on the paddleboard. Let's just say that. But uh, so imagine you're, you're on this paddleboard and, you know, trying and maybe struggling. Okay, so let's think about this. Let's think about four guys are all in that situation. They're on on paddle boards and and they're struggling. Um, And we're gonna use these things we've just been talking about. Um, One guy's struggling because he's he's dealing with um, struggles in his marriage. One guy's struggling because of anxiety and stress. One guy's struggling, you know, all these different things. Um, So if you've got four guys who are struggling, now imagine a big, tidal wave comes and it washes over these four guys who are already struggling on their paddle boards because of other things. Now this new wave just really throws them off balance. And, and that's the way that I see what's happening with these four inner battles for men. Then this other tidal wave comes and makes fighting those battles even harder. So what is that tidal wave? I'm going to sum it up in two words. Artificial sex. Artificial sex as opposed to real in-person sex. Artificial sex, digital sexual content. um, the, The kind of sexual content, erotic content that's all around us today. Whether that be the erotic content that may not fall under the category of pornography, but this, this erotic content that's now mainstream on television, on the internet, in various places, on social media. And then, of course, all the pornography that's available on the internet and on through our television and on our phones. And trust me, this is not the pornography of our parents' generation. You know, just pictures of naked people in a magazine. These are Digital, these are full immersive digital experiences with video, audio, and it's also um, infinite variety and it's also infinitely extreme, or it can parts of it it can range into that. So, last session I made the point that um, in this explosion of erotic content that is facing our world today. That it's affecting men in the church a lot. Um, and again, and not just men, women as well. And I'll give you a few statistics that relate to that. Uh, I just need to say again that the primary focus of my work has been working with men around this stuff, but obviously recognize that, that women are challenged in this area as well. So I said last week, or at the last session a couple, day, couple nights ago, 65% of men in churches uh, say that they are regular users of pornography and, you know, semi-regular, whatever regular means to them. 50% of pastors 
and 25% of women in churches. This was 2019. A couple of different um, survey companies, a couple of different studies with this, with these numbers. And um, now, here's the thing. That's pre-COVID. And we know that things got worse during COVID. That's also self-reported, right? So what actually happens when people look at computer usage, right? Because it's one thing to get a survey and then they ask you, how much porn have you looked at? Or have you looked at this, that, or the other thing? And you, ah, I don't think I did. What about when people actually have access to look at people's computer records? And so three researchers did this and they published their results in um, an article on PubMed. You can find it on PubMed. Um, Solano, Eaton, and O'Leary. And they were able to do the, I think, the largest research that I'm aware of on this topic where they worked with Amazon. Uh, Amazon has connections with the web use of a variety of um, ISPs. And so uh, they took that database and, you know, we think we're anonymous online, but we absolutely aren't. So they were able to track um, the usage of a bunch of users. And so they got together the data from um, almost 1,400 users, 1,390-some, 1,390-some. And it was people from across the United States, a randomized uh, group of people from across the United States, ranging from age 18 to 70. Um, and what they did is they just, uh, they were able to get access to their web surfing for uh, over a period of 30 days. How much, how many people do you suppose were viewing pornography um, during those 30 days? Here's what they found. 91% of the men had access to pornography and 60% of the women had access to pornography in that 30-day period. So this is an issue. Uh, this is going on. It's more prevalent than most people would like to admit. And uh, now, to be clear, it's not everyone. And there's a lot of people, you know, even within that that number of people, there's probably a lot of those people that that looked at something, stumbled across something, and but it's really not a big issue in their life. But my point here is that there is a lot of people who are struggling. And that what we're experiencing today, this is a this is a new, a, a, and, and a big issue. It, it has come on like a tidal wave, especially since the let's say mid two thousands, which I'll get into in just a little bit. We have now widespread and reliable high speed internet. Uh, we have widespread use of smartphones, so people are actually able to get high speed internet on their phones anywhere, anytime. Now, and for men, our sex drive is this powerful and primal urge that we have. And so when this is getting tweaked all the time by this, not all the time, but, you know, on, so often, um, this is a very powerful destabilizing force in our relationships, uh, in our sense of personal morality, in our faith. Um, and it makes all these other things dramatically worse um, in terms of stress and anxiety. You know, porn use, uh, surfing the internet for erotic content, social media, it's, it's a huge time suck. And it's a huge energy drain. And men get pulled into this rabbit hole. And when they're done, when they, when they come back out of that rabbit hole, do you think they feel renewed, happy, confident, energized? motivated to do the, their great work in life, to connect with their partner? Of course not. It's like exactly the opposite. You know, this is why, really, there is a the growing chorus of anti-porn activists. It's A lot of it is coming from people who are not connected at all to religion. Uh, they're not interested in the in the morality of it, they just see it as damaging to men. They just see it as how it hurts the users of 
the pornography. And so they're trying to help people get out of it because it's so destructive. What about loneliness and isolation? You know, especially in, in religious settings, in Christian settings like ours, men who are dealing with this are dealing with it alone. They, we have shame about it. We're struggling with this, but not willing to talk about it. That's going on. Then what about lack of intimacy? If that's a problem, then you add this struggle to it. It just compounds everything, makes everything worse. Think about this. Think about how many couples will not be connecting sexually this week because one of them, who's usually the one who initiates, just is taking care of himself, right, with pornography or whatever. And so the, those opportunities for the couple to connect don't happen. And the, the lust and disconnection and spiritual disconnection just continues to build. And then, of course, the meaningful spiritual life, how that gets damaged. Again, I think this should be obvious, but people living in with a constant experience or, or continual experience of, of defeat and struggle in this area that is so core to who we are. Uh, it's obviously very damaging. All right. In 2006, Kent Hughes uh, said this, sensuality is easily the biggest obstacle to godliness among men today, and it is wreaking havoc in the church. I 100% agree. And I also think it's interesting that Hughes wrote that well, it was published in 2006. We probably wrote it in 2004 or 2005 before the widespread availability of high-speed internet brought um, artificial sex to, to, you know, exploded. And before smartphone use became widespread, so that exploded. So that was 2005. What would he say today? So <clears throat> what do we do about this? How do, we, how do we deal with this? How do we overcome these internal battles, these internal struggles that men are facing? So five things I'm going to talk about. And the first one is that we've got to really understand the problem. In other words, before we can solve anything, we got to be sure we understand what we're dealing with. And the problems that we're talking about here, remember, stress and anxiety, loneliness, isolation, struggling with intimacy with your partner, spiritual disillusionment, those four getting wrapped, you know, with sexual temptation, um, sexual provocation that's around um, mixing in with all of those, they, these issues, they all affect each other and they're affected by each other. That's a, a point I'm going to come back to a little bit later. Uh, so we've got to understand what's going on. And, and now I'm going to get to the, what I think is probably one of the most important things I'm going to say tonight. If you don't remember anything else about tonight, remember this. <clears throat> the explosion of artificial sex that I'm talking about is a new problem. It's a huge problem, and it's a new problem. It is unprecedented. And that's why we're having so much trouble with it. And people don't understand this, and that's why, especially in the church, we're trying to be help help people with this. But if we don't really understand what we're dealing with, we're, not, we're going to offer, quote-unquote, help that's not helpful. People always want to say, well, there's nothing new under the sun. That's from the book of Ecclesiastes. There's nothing new, you know, when it comes to sex. Well, we've always had sexual temptation. There's always been stuff that people would, you know, turn to that were, was erotic. There, there, you know, people would talk about the book of Corinthians, for example. Paul's writing about this group, that this church that had a lot of sexual stuff going on. It is not the same. It's a different situation. We have that plus something else. So <clears throat> think about it this way. For all of recorded history, if you wanted to get sexually aroused, if you wanted to have a sexual experience, do you know what you needed? A person. <laughs> you needed to have someone who 
would would do something, you would have some visual thing, you would have some experience that would, would be arousing for you, or then you would have some sort of experience with that person. You could in your... Uh, always we could have our imagination could could uh, conjure something. We could fantasize about something. But the actual arousal, the actual um, sexual experience, that required a person. Go to a, you are a caveman, go to the uh, cave and look at a stick figure drawing. Is that going to be big arousal? Um, or maybe if you were very, very fortunate, just had the opportunity sometime in the Middle Ages, you could go to the museum and you could see a painting someone painted of a of a naked person. And that could be, that might be arousing, I suppose. You could go and see a um, sculpture of a, of a body and that would probably... Uh, create a, a thought that, again, would, would maybe um, arouse the opportunity for you to fantasize. But you see how it's, 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 um, it, it's things that bring associations and reminders and to some degree a certain sexual provocation. But now, all, what really all that does is create a longing, give you a vision for a fantasy that you might create later. Well, here we are now, in the 20th century, we now have um, pictures, so you could see something that is exactly the same as you would see a person. Then we have video, and we have live, uh, you can see something happening, and you can hear something happening, and that is a fundamentally, that's a fundamental shift. Um, <clears throat> the digital, well, let me put it this way. Technology now allows us to have an artificial sexual experience. When it's immersive enough with, you know, good quality uh, video and audio, what that does is it activates the mirror neurons in your brain. And so you are then able to put yourself in that situation. You have that experience. That's why when there's like a scary movie, you enter into that experience and you get scared because, uh, again, you're, you're not just watching something, you're immersing yourself into it as if you're experiencing it. And that's what is happening with um, high definition video, pornographic experiences, you enter into that sexual experience. So it creates an artificial sexual experience that was not possible before. And this changes uh, our, our sexual world. And so the tidal wave of artificial sex is the second wave of the sexual revolution. The sexual revolution started maybe, was it about a century ago? And, and the, the first wave of the sexual revolution came about through technology or came about as a result of technology, which was the technology of widely accessible and affordable birth control. And therefore, because of access to this birth control, now people could have sex without the likelihood of pregnancy. Not 100%, obviously, but it, it, it shifted the view of sex so that you... A, a, a person you would not need to have sex with, a high high value person to you, or a highly, like a reliable person who's who's prob who has a great potential to be, or a high probability of being a your parent with you. No, that's off the table. You can just now. It makes casual sex possible, and that created the sexual revolution. The second wave of the sexual revolution is fueled by a new technology, which is immersive digital video, which, so the first revolution or the first wave allowed you or allowed people to have uh, a sexual experience with someone in a casual relationship because there was not necessarily the likelihood of having kids. But now you can have a sexual experience of a sort without any relationship at all. 
Um, in the first wave, you didn't need a high value person or a reliable future parent. Now you don't need anybody at all. You don't need a person. The first wave made casual sex possible. The second wave makes artificial sex possible. Now, I'm not the first one to point this out. Dr. Al Cooper um, was a sex researcher, and he passed away uh, uh, some years ago. In the mid, early to mid-90s, he started to talk about this, and he created this model or talked about this vision he had as the Internet was in its infancy as he was writing this. And he foresaw a day, and he was very concerned about this vision, a day when the internet and the way that it makes sex available would fundamentally transform in a very disturbing way or destructive way uh, the sex life of many people. And what he, the AAA engine was that he said when, when, um, Access to pornographic ex sexual experiences becomes accessible, affordable, and allows people to have these experiences anonymously. It's going to create a tidal wave. And um, uh, Dr. Cooper ended his life. He, he um, died by suicide. And uh, I, I know someone who knew him and talked about how he was very... Uh, bothered by what by what he foresaw, and he was right. So we have to understand and deal with uh, in our world today how destructive artificial sex is, and the way that it's pulling us apart. Because if you think about the purpose of sexuality, the purpose of sex is to bring us together. Right, Genesis chapter two. Um, the first words spoken between the man and the woman, um, <clears throat> Adam says, this is not bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And then we have this, this language that is repeated twice late, later in the Bible, in the New Testament, and we hear it over and over in wedding ceremonies. The two will be, will be united and will become one flesh. Sex is what unites us, makes brings the two into one. That is, real sex, person-to-person -person sex. Artificial sex does the exact opposite. It pulls us apart. It facilitates a sexual experience that has nothing to do with relationship, has nothing to do with another person at all. It makes coming together, it makes intimacy irrelevant. Now, this is exactly what's happening around the world. People think that pornography and um, the erotic stuff that's out there, that, that would stimulate our sex drive, and so it would make people want more sex. Um, that may be true about some of the erotic material, but particularly pornography, it also was maybe true about old-school pornography, but the pornography of today, as I said, it creates its own sexual experience for someone. So porn doesn't make you want to have sex. It makes you want more porn. And that's why it's so profoundly addictive. It actually makes you want real in-person sex less. Now, if you don't believe me, I would invite you to Google this term, the Great Sex Recession or sex recession, what some observers are saying we're moving into, which is a reduction of actual in-person sex all across the board, uh, across age cohorts, single, married, etc. <clears throat> and maybe you've seen some articles about this. Um, one article that's made a lot of rounds was based on research that came out of an organization, or I guess it's a project called the General Social Survey. And this is an ongoing research project that uh, they use the data from this 
for uh, a lot of journalism uses this data and uh, public policy policymakers use it as well. But they released a port a report a couple years ago uh, saying that America Americans today have less sex than they have ever had, uh, at least as, as as far back as they were able to, uh, they've been able to track this. Um, they found also that more young people today are uh, are not having sex than has ever been the case since they've been tracking it. Um, the one group that has been having a little more sex is seniors, um, and you know I suppose that's longevity and and some of the um, medications that are available. But for the most part, and it's it is fairly significant, the the drop in sexual activity. Now, so this is so much an issue that is that it is a a, a demographics problem or has the potential of becoming a demographics problem. And there are a lot of factors going on here. I'll, I'll, I'll say this, but isn't it ironic that this trend is happening right at the time that we have the, this explosion of artificial sex? So there are a number of... Um, of government researchers from a number of countries who are very concerned about this. Um, I first heard about this years ago, actually, uh, with trends emerging in Japan. And now it's being talked about here, a variety of countries. In fact, I just like a couple days ago saw an article in Bloomberg about South Korea is now tripling payments that they give to new parents because they are uh, so concerned about low birth rates. And again, all of this, I believe, relates to this challenge of artificial sex that is pulling us apart rather than bringing us together. So we got to understand that if we're going to deal with it. And secondly, if we're going to deal with this, <clears throat> we got to stop making our sex drive the problem. Stop making our sex drive the enemy. Sexual desire is not the problem. Misplaced sexual desire. Misdirected sexual desire. That's the problem. See, it's just biology. Males of every species have a built-in primary drive of procreation. And so do we. That is, that is a huge part of the male drive we have the capacity as human beings created in God's image. We have consciousness, awareness. We, we are not slaves to our animalistic instincts, <clears throat> and yet they're, they're powerful. So what do we do about it? It's just this biology to recognize how powerful this drive is. And if we forget that, we're going we're gonna to really have problems. It's also, this is just theology, right? The first thing that God says to human beings is recorded in Genesis 1. It is called the creation mandate. And God tells them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. And so that's kind of built in to who we are. Now, of course, Jesus talks about other places in the Bible, talk about the, the danger of sex out of control. Jesus talks about the danger of lust in Matthew 5. But lust is not uh, synonymous with sexual desire. Lust is synonymous with misdirected sexual desire. Lust is sexual desire minus intimacy. It's sexual desire cut off from concern about or care for the person. Which, I mean, in essence, that's, that's by the way, that's essentially what pornography is, right? That's what artificial sex is, is it's about fueling the sexual desire completely separate from a intimate relationship with a person. Sexual desire itself is holy. It's this desire, uh, it's this urge, it's this drive 
to come together, to be united. In fact, that desire is so holy in the Bible that Paul uses that term, that same quotation from Genesis that talks about the two becoming united, becoming one flesh, uses that exact quote and applies it to the union of Christ and the church, the union of Christ dwelling in us individually as believers through the Holy Spirit. So the whole focus of what we're trying to do with the Renewed Man program is to get people, to get men to stop denying or trying to suppress their sex drive, to get them to stop feeling ashamed about their sexual desires, but instead accept that drive and then learn to control it, to focus and channel it towards things that are good and healthy, to master it rather than be enslaved by it. In fact, we use that term, sexual self-mastery. In fact, self-mastery applied to other things as well. Uh, Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12. I'm not going to be the ma- let be mastered by anything. I'm not going to let that be my master. I'm going to be the master of my... Uh, he was actually talking about sex there, by the way. Sex drive. All right. Third thing we need to do, sex drive is not our enemy. Third, we must break the conspiracy of silence. If we're going to deal with this, we've got to start talking about it in helpful ways, in life-giving ways. I know it's uncomfortable. um, And I'm not just talking about sexual struggles either. Of course, it's hard to talk about sexual integrity in the church and mixed company. We maybe sometimes feel shame, or if we talk openly about sexual stuff, it can get weird really fast, even create an unsafe environment. We want to be careful about this. We need to be careful about this. That's one of the reasons why, as I work with this, I work with, uh, you know, men in in groups of men, but I've also taught in a lot of settings with with mixed groups. I understand how that it can be difficult to deal with, but we've got to find people that we can talk to openly, honestly, recognizing that that many of us are dealing with this. It's hard for men to talk about a lot of stuff. It's hard to talk about our stress, our anxiety, how much pressure we feel. It's hard to talk about problems we're having um, in our marriage or our family. It's hard to talk about spiritual doubts, spiritual confusion, especially if you're, you know, the, the one place where you can talk with people is in your church where you don't want to talk about that stuff in the church. So where do I go? So here's what I want to say about, about this. And this might be one of the most important issues for you as a man is to come to terms with your need to have some people, uh, a a couple of guys that you can actually be open with. We were created for this. If we don't have this, it damages us in so many ways. So take a risk. That's what I want to say. Take a risk. I bet everyone who's listening to this could think of one or two people that they could be honest with. Maybe it's someone in your church. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a a connection friend from some other context. But find someone and and just open up. And if nothing else, hopefully, as I've been talking about the, the prevalence of some of these struggles, especially the prevalence of the sexual struggles, so if you talk to someone about that, chances are good. You, you statistically likely that that person will get it and be struggling too. So we got to end our conspiracy of silence. And number four, we got to move a little quickly here. We're moving towards the end of our time. But the uh, fourth thing we need to do if we're going to deal with our problems as men is we must approach these problems holistically. And I talked about that earlier, how these different things are kind of wrapped up together. And so I learned this pretty early on as I was working with men, uh, again, in the area specifically of sexual struggle. And, um, you know, over time, I would 
uh, we would do the workshops and then I would work with people in a follow-up program in the months after they went through this workshop as they're trying to work it out and and to see how they struggled or you know which guys did well and which guys didn't and what was going on. Anyway, so this this idea, this way of thinking about it came to my mind. And so imagine a beach ball. And <clears throat> so for many let, again, we're going to focus on sexuality, the, the overcoming or dealing with our sexual integrity, sexual struggles. So here's what happens is guys, for whatever reason, maybe their wife catches them doing something or something happens, they get in control or get out of control or something hits in their minds. They're like, I got to do something about this. So they get very excited and enthused and committed and the um, the willpower goes up. And I got to deal with this problem. And so what they do is they maybe, you know, seek help from someone. They read a book. They go see a therapist. They might go to a workshop. And they they uh, are going to focus their energy now on controlling this problem. And so it's like having a beach ball. And then you're swimming around in this beach ball. I want to keep this thing underwater. I want to get it out of sight. I want to keep it out of sight. And so they push it down. And here's the thing. When you push that down, push that beach ball down, you can do it for a while, just for a little bit of time, if you focus lots and lots of your time and energy and focus on keeping that thing underwater. But eventually what happens is you get distracted, you get tired, you look over somewhere, and then all of a sudden, boom, the thing pops back up because it's got all this pressure pushing back up. That's what happens if we deal, if we try to deal with our anxiety just that way, just focusing and trying to push that down. That's what happens if we try to deal with, um, you know, relationship struggles or especially uh, trying to control our sexual struggles. If we just try to do that by by um, clamping down on it, it's not it's not going to work long term. And the the problem, the reason why everyone forgets about this, is that. You can get it to work for a little while. And so certain things seem successful because they help guys for a little while. Um, but the, the issue is what happens long term. Figure out a way to push the air out of that thing, right? So <clears throat> these challenges that men are facing today, these five that uh, I particularly feel the, the calling to focus on, um, they're all rolling, rolled up together. And um, the last one that I've just been talking about here kind of weaves its way throughout all of them. And the way that we deal with any of them is by dealing with all of them. And the way that you help with this one is you can find help in this other area and that improves this other area. So it kind of all moves together. And that's a big part of how I've come to believe I need to work with people in a holistic way. Okay, number five, how we deal with this, we, we must let go or we must get on a path of doing something daily. We must let go of the idea of just dabbling at something, giving it like 100% of attention for, for a few weeks and then go on to something else. We've got to figure out a way to keep it, keep our focus on it. <clears throat> Tony Robbins, um, the self-help guy, says, if you want lasting change, you have to give up this idea of just trying something and you have to commit yourself to mastery. That means not just dabbling, but fully immersing yourself because your life is not controlled by what you do some of the time, but by what you do consistently. And so what we need to do is to find ways with whatever of these issues we're wanting to, we, we realize we need to deal with, is to find a way to get something in my life, some habit, some discipline, some way where I'm able to connect with that commitment every day, where I'm reminded of that, where I my um, my awareness it, it 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 comes back into my awareness. And so that that over time allows a massive transformation when we engage in it over time. Okay, I'm 
Speaking of time, I'm out of time. We've been going for about 45 minutes now. Real quick, where do we go from here? What's next? So this is the second of three videos. And um, so the third and final one is coming up on Thursday. So if you would, right now, before I do anything else, if you would, just make a comment on the YouTube video uh, if you have any question that you'd like me to address, if you have um, any thoughts, just reactions of what you've been, um, what I've been talking about tonight. So if you'd put those in the comments and then make plans to join us on Thursday. We're going to talk about this issue of intimacy in marriage, relational intimacy, like emotional intimacy and physical intimacy, this area that is, again, a struggle for many, many people. And then third, I'm going to put this one out there right now. So there's this is a three-week, um, three-session, not three-week, but three-session seminar. Um, and, and as I said, it is the, I, I'm using this to launch this new program and I'm, I'm committed to, to offer solid teaching in this seminar and not just do a sales, a sales pitch or a sales presentation. What I want to do is, if after hearing this, you want to hear more, you want to consider being a part of, of, a, of a group program that takes this stuff sort of like to the next level, then I'm going to do another, um, another live stream like this on Friday night. So same deal. You can watch it live. Join us live for it. Or if you want to, you know, hear about it, you can also watch the recording. But that's where I'm going to talk about the Renewed Man program and, and how you could be a part of it. And, you know, don't sign up yet for it because um, there's uh, some opportunities I have, uh, discounts or whatever. So um, I'll be talking about that on Friday night. So for now, thank you again for watching. Have a great night, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.